Hello, good morning everybody. I'm glad some of you survived the party. <laughs> it looks like it lasts long. <laughs> so we are here for another wonderful day of, uh, of uh, interesting sessions. And, uh, and now I leave the word to Chiara Di Francesco Marino from FBK in Trento and she will talk ab about a predictive process monitoring on which she has been working long about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Massimiliano, thanks a lot. So good morning everybody. And um, so uh, this session was, um, was assumed to be presented by myself and Chiara Ghidini, but unfortunately she couldn't be here today, so you have to listen to me for <laughs> one hour and a half. <laughs> so this session is about predictive process monitoring. So, what is predictive process monitoring? Well, predictive process monitoring is, uh, deals with predicting the future of ongoing execution. So, what will happen in the future to our ongoing executions? And uh, this is somehow the outline that uh, I would like to uh, present today. I would give a very short introduction to what predictive process monitoring is. And then uh, we will uh, have a look at the predictive process monitoring uh, by looking at it from uh, three main uh, dimensions, and then we'll take one of these dimensions and we will uh, look a bit more in detail at, um, at uh, these dimensions, at, at the pipeline related to this dimension. And then we will uh, we see an overview of uh, new trends uh, in, uh, let's say, these uh, uh, yeah, new trends of predictive process monitoring, or if you want a new trend in uh, machine learning based uh, operational support, and then we will see at the end some uh, tool support. So let's start with the, the introduction to predictive process monitoring. So just to look to place a bit what how predictive process monitoring is placed with respect to process mining. You may have seen in these days that uh, we have uh, in um, in process mining two types of data. We have pre or post mortem event data and post and pre mortem event data. Well, the post mortem event data refers to cases uh, to executions that have already completed and then that cannot be modified anymore. While uh, pre mortem event data refer to cases that are still ongoing, still running, that are still alive, and so we still can do something with these executions that are ongoing. So uh, I think that uh, many of the uh, sessions that you have attended in these days uh, have been related to this post-mortem data. So like for instance, the discovery is related to uh, data that are, already, uh, that are already concluded. While operational support is this part of process mining that focuses instead on pre-mortem data. So for instance, uh, and, and, and that support me making decisions on, on, on executions that are ongoing, on cases that are ongoing. So for instance, if you look at these execution uh, trees here, we can think this as uh, the history of a patient, let's say John. So John is uh, registered at the hospital at 8 a.m. He uh, is visited at 8.15, and uh, now at 8.54, well, I was almost, <laughs> almost uh, precise with the time. Let's assume that now is 8.54. Yes, uh, is going to perform x-ray. So this is the past and the present of John's history that we know, but we don't know what will happen in the future. So of this execution, we know the past and the present, but we do not know the future. Well, what can we do now with this, with this ongoing execution? Well, one thing that we can do is we can detect if something went wrong. So if what the, the x-ray that we are performing now is something that shouldn't happen. We can predict what will happen to John in the future. So we can look at the future of John. And uh, we can also recommend something to John in order to achieve a certain objective or a certain goal. So these are, let's say, the three activities that uh, in the big picture of process mining operational support, which is this part of process mining that deals with pre-mortem data, so data that are ongoing, you can carry on. And uh, what we will focus on today is more on the predict, on the prediction part, and we will see something about the recommendation part. So, what is predict? Well, uh, whenever we use our information systems, you have, may have seen we collect a lot of historical data that we can store, 
and this historical data can be used in order to train a model. And this model can then, at runtime, when John's history is uh, being executed, can be uh, queried by the operational support system in order to provide predictions about the future of, uh, of John's execution, and then return these predictions to, to the user. Okay, so let me say it in other words. What is predictive process monitoring? Well, Predictive process monitoring takes as input a set of historical traces, an event log, a set of post-mortem event data, and an ongoing trace, so a trace that is still running, and it returns a prediction on the future of this ongoing trace. Or if you want, given a prediction problem, like for instance, whether John will recover soon or not, and given a set of historical traces, so again, post-mortem event data, predictive process monitoring techniques builds a model, and so that at runtime, when we have John's history, John's trace going on, it will return the prediction. Okay. And this concludes the first, uh, the, the overall introduction. I hope that everything is clear of this, this, this thing on this thing. Okay, now let's try to uh, focus, to look at predictive process monitoring along three main dimensions that uh, help us also to somehow classify the predictive process monitoring uh, state-of-the-art approach, uh, to classify the state-of-the-art approach of predictive process monitoring. So, what are these three dimensions? Okay, the first dimension is what we want to predict. So, the type of prediction that we want to return. So, for instance, we can, we can predict an outcome, which can be, for instance, the outcome of our John's ongoing execution. So, for instance, will John recover soon? We can predict the number when John is going to, uh, to recover, or we can predict sequences of uh, next, uh, next activities that John is going to, to do. But we will see it later. The second dimension is what kind of information we are going to use in order to make predictions. So we can use only the control flow, so the sequence of activities of uh, our data. We can take into account also the data payload associated to this sequence of activities. And we can uh, also consider some unstructured information, some untextual information, or we can also take into account some contextual information. And the third dimension is instead related to the, how we are going to make uh, these predictions. And uh, we can classify state of, current state-of-the-art approaches on predictive process monitoring in two big families. The ones that uh, work with an explicit uh, process model, and the ones that instead use machine learning or deep learning techniques in order to, uh, to make predictions. Let's have a look a bit more in detail at each of these three dimensions. Let's start from the the dimension one, so what, we do, what do we want to predict? And let's look again at our John's history. And uh, now we have, I think, an activity more. So he registered at eight, he go to the radiology department at 8.10, and he, um, he get the visit at 8.15, and then at 8.54 performs X-ray. What we can ask ourselves, or what we can ask to predictive process monitoring about the future of John? Well, for instance, we can ask some, uh, uh, some questions like whether John will need some ultrasound. So this is a question that we can classify as an outcome-based uh, prediction in the sense that the answer to this question will be a kind of categorical value. Yes, no, true, false, or a, a, a categorical value. Another question that we can, and in this case the answer, if, we, if our predictive process monitoring returns a correct answer, will be yes, because we can see that uh, uh, in the future John is going to perform ultrasound. We can, we can also ask whether, when John is going to, to have ultrasound, and this, uh, we can classify this as a numerical prediction, in the sense that the answer to this question is actually a number, which can be, for instance, in this case, at 9.20 p.m. But we can also ask to our predictive process monitoring techniques what, what John is going to do now on. So what are the sequence of activities that John is going to perform from now on in the future? Okay, so this is the first dimension and then we will uh, look at uh, a bit more in detail using these three dimensions at uh, the different uh, pipelines. 
Okay, let's move to the second dimension. What I mean when I say what kind of information we can use? Well, we said, okay, we can use the control flow. So just the sequence of activities of our execution traces. Or we can use also the data associated to the events, the data payload. So for instance, the timestamp, but also, I don't know, the resource who carried out the activity or whatever other kind of, um, of data payload. Sometimes we can have some unstructured information, some textual information also available. And so sometimes you can use also some textual information for uh, helping your prediction, your predictive process monitoring approach to make predictions. And uh, finally, we can also use sometimes some contextual information. So for instance, when John is going to perform x-ray, maybe it can be available some information about uh, whether a certain scan machine is free or not. So these are the different types of input that we can use. And today we will focus especially on the control flow and on the, on the data payload. Okay, let's move on the third dimension. So what kind of approach we are going to use to make uh, predictions? Well, in general, in predictive process monitoring approach work uh, in a way that we have two phases. We have a training phase in which uh, we, um, we learn from uh, an event log a, a model. And then at runtime, when we have our ongoing trace, we have a second phase, which is the runtime phase. When we have our on ongoing execution, we can query this model in order to get the prediction. And uh, we can say that, uh, as I anticipated before, there exist two big families. One is the family of the model-based approach. In this family, we have actually uh, a kind of an explicit representation of the process model. We can say that uh, the, the main characteristic of the model-based approach is that you have a kind of an explicit process model. You can see the, the, the process model. And usually you enrich it with uh, different types of information that help then you to get uh, the prediction. And uh, we have instead the family of supervised learning approaches in which you usually use machine learning or deep learning techniques. And in this case, you do not have an explicit, uh, you have just an implicit process model, but you do not see the states or the steps of your process model. It's a machine learning model, so it's a different kind of model. And we will mainly look at supervised learning approaches in, uh, in this session. But uh, I would like to give you a brief uh, uh, idea, uh, an idea about also the, the model-based approach. So I will first go through uh, the, um, to, get you, to give you the idea of the model-based approach. So how does the model-based approach? Oh, first of all, there are questions so far. Please. So um, can you, you are saying if uh, we train the data, we train uh, the model before with the, some post-mortem data, so with data that are completed, then we train our model. And then when you have an execution which is incomplete, you are going to query uh, your model and you are going to predict some delay. So you learn from, from the past, let's say, what, uh, what has happened in the past, and you predict what will happen to a new case which has a similar behavior to some behavior that you have observed in the past. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is, that this is for the part of recommendation, and that's true, but for the part of prediction, that's also true. But uh, of course, uh, maybe also your ongoing execution is an execution that will be late, and so you want to predict that it will be late in order to take an action in case to recommend an action to avoid to be late. But you should learn also from, the, from your errors. So if you observe some errors in the past, you need to be able to predict that also your ongoing execution will be late, so that maybe then you can take an action. Okay? And the second question? Um, 
Okay, well, when you when you get okay, this were more uh, this part is was more focused on predictions. But when you make uh, okay, of course you can make a wrong rec recommendation. But uh, especially if you if you are dealing with uh, um, let's say hospital things, these are just suggestions. And of course the doctor has to. I mean, of of course you cannot take these techniques and give them to the doctors and say okay now you apply it and don't, don't think anymore. So of course there could be there could be errors. And so in that case uh, it is important that the doctor has uh, has his own view on 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 that. Okay. Did, okay. I, I, I have a question about the pre-mortem and post-mortem concept mm -hmm. in which, um, uh, what about the event log? How the event log will be generated in the pre-mortem and post-mortem technique? So um, uh, it, 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 uh, what I get is like that, there is a process going on mm -hmm. and uh, we, we are dealing with the process in a real time. Mm -hmm. At a moment, we are see, uh, seeing the pattern of the past behavior of the process and what is the behavior now, and we stop the process there, and we, we will predict the uh, next events based on the previous history. Mm -hmm. So what kind of event log will be there? It will be continuous, stored in the form of table or what? Okay. I mean, it, it, it could be whatever kind of form, actually, your, your, your ongoing execution. It's just, I mean, the important thing is that, as you said, you stop the execution for, you stop the execution. You are at that point in time and you stop there and you, uh, and, and you, and you make a prediction on, 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 that, on that execution. The important thing is that you collect the information. Then uh, if it is, it can also be an event log with just one trace and uh, from when the execution, of, when the patient entered, for instance, just to keep this example, when if the history you are looking at are the history of patients starting from when they enter in the hospital, you take the history of your ongoing patient from when he or she entered in the hospital up to, up to now. You, you are dealing with several process executions, but the process possibly is the same one, right? So you are dealing with several process executions, and in this case, with this kind of uh, algorithms, the, the, the most consuming part is not making a prediction, which is quite fast, and you can deal it also with several patients because it's kind of very fast. What it takes time is to build the model, w that you have to train the model, and so this is the most time-consuming part, and for that thing you need to reserve some, some time slot. So I, I, I don't think, I mean, predictions are very fast when you, when you just query the, the model that's very fast, okay? Okay, so if uh, there are no other questions, I will go <laughs> ahead. So the model-based uh, approach, uh, so I was telling you there are these two families of approach. Let me just uh, give a quick overview about the model-based approach. So the idea is that you start from uh, historical traces and uh, you can already have a model that you have discovered, a process model that you have discovered, or you can discover a process uh, model during the training phase. And once you have this uh, uh, model, you enrich it with some information that you extract from the event log. And uh, this is the training part. And then at runtime, when you have your ongoing trace, what you do is uh, you query your enriched model in order to get, uh, to get a prediction. Uh, just uh, I really give you one example of uh, the, the very the simplest example about uh, and at a very abstract level of this kind of uh, family of approach. So usually, uh, let's assume that uh, these traces, sigma 1 to sigma 4, is uh, our event log that uh, we use for learning a, 
an explicit process model that we want to use with this first family of approaches, which are the model-based approach. And let's assume that we have this ongoing trace, which is just given by compute rate and visit patient, and we want to predict uh, what is the rem remaining cycle time of this execution. So when this execution, what is the remaining time until the end of this execution. So one of these approaches uh, just build the uh, transition system of starting from the event log, so from tracy sigma one to sigma four. I won't go into the details of the construction of the transition system. And then what, uh, uh, what we, so we have a kind of an explicit representation of the different steps of our process model. And then what we do is uh, annotating this uh, transition system with the information on the remaining time of our, of our traces. So for instance, uh, if we look at the state where we have visit to patient and we look at the traces that uh, passes through that, uh, that state, we see that for sigma one, the remaining time at the time of visit patient is 11 hours because it's from 7 a.m. to 18 p.m. For sigma two, we have eight hours because it is from 8 a.m. to 16 p.m. And for sigma four, we have seven hours. And then we compute the average of this, of the, all the traces that passes, for the, of the remaining time of all the traces that passes for that, uh, for that state. We do the same for all our states. So for instance, also for compute rate, the remaining time is six hours. We compute the average. And we do this for all the states. And then when we have our ongoing trace, we see what is the state where, where we are. For instance, in this case, we are in this state here. And the answer to our question will be, will be so what is the remaining time? Will be just four hours. Because this is, we have learned from past execution what was the average time that it could take uh, before the end of the execution. And um, so it's really at an abstract level, but I wanted to give you the intuition of this family of approaches. Okay, what about instead the approach based on machine learning or deep learning? Well, the, in this kind of approach, so we have a slightly different pipeline in the sense that first we extract prefixes from our event log. Once we have extracted the prefixes, we encode these uh, prefixes of the traces into a format which is understandable by our machine learning technique. Then we apply a machine learning technique or a deep learning technique, in general a supervised learning technique. And uh, this is at the training time, what we do with our post-mortem event, event data. And then at runtime, we have our not yet completed execution trace. We encode also this trace in a format which is understandable by machine learning models. And we query the machine learning model in order to get a prediction. OK. But why we need to compute the prefixes? So the idea is that, of course, our ongoing trace is an incomplete trace. So if we want to learn the correlations between, if we want to make predictions on the future of our ongoing trace, which is just an ongoing trace, we need to learn correlations among past data, but just prefixes of past data, not complete past data, and what we want to predict. And that's why we need to compute trace prefixes, because we want to teach our model that uh, there exists a correlation between just prefixes of our traces and what we want to predict and the final, uh, and the final outcome of uh, what we want to predict, for instance, between uh, the first two activities and uh, the final outcome of the execution, or the first three activity and the final outcome of the execution. And uh, so, yeah, we start from the event log and the first step, as you have seen in the pipeline, is computing uh, the prefixes. What prefixes shall, shall we choose? Well, it first of all depends on what is the problem you want to, uh, you want to, so what is the prediction problem that you have in mind. Of course, if you want to predict the final outcome, you do not care too much about what kind of prefixes prefix you are considering. You can consider whatever kind of prefix. But of course, if you want to make a prediction at the beginning of your execution, for, for instance, the time in which an activity, which is usually at the beginning of your execution, of course, you need to be careful to choose a prefix which, uh, which, is, which, uh, which happens before that, uh, that, the, that activity ex um, is executed. And, uh, and then it could depend on how early you want to make your predictions. Of course, the earlier, the better. 
if you are able to make uh, your predictions when you observed only a few events, it is better because, uh, of course, there is more unknown future that you are able to uh, predict. Uh, in the, so, in general, what you can do when you train your models, you, there exist different, different strategies. One possibility is that you, uh, since also these machine learning techniques usually require vectors of the same size, what you can do, you can also decide to uh, train different predictive models for different prefix length. So you can have one predictive model for prefix length two, one predictive model for prefix length three, three and so on and so forth. Or you can put all your prefixes all together and having a huge big model. And in this case, sometimes you need to use some padding to, uh, to have these vectors of the same size. But we will see these, these two aspects a bit uh, more later with the bucketing, uh, with the bucketing part and with the, yeah, with the bucketing part. Okay, so this concludes the introduction about the three, the three dimensions. And uh, now we can, uh, if there are no questions, we can go, we can go through the three um, type of predictions that we have seen uh, that we have seen before. So the outcomes, the numerical values, and the next events, and look a bit uh, at uh, what are the characteristics of these three types of predictions. So let's start from the prediction of outcomes. So as we said before, we are interested to predict. In, with this kind of prediction, uh, to predict a categorical value, which can be true, false, yes, no, or whatever other kind of categorical value. So this means that the label of our traces, so what we want to learn of our historical trace is the correlation between the execution and the label, which is the categorical value that we want to predict. So when we train our model, we need to have a label, which is a categorical value. So, uh, what we want to learn, actually, is a function that, uh, given uh, our log uh, labeled with, uh, um, with the final answer for these uh, execution traces in the event log, returns uh, a label, and this label should be as close as possible when we have any on an ongoing execution. When we query our model with an ongoing execution, this label should be as close as possible to the actual label of the future of John's uh, of John's history. So, for instance, uh, it, this is the, the, the case of questions like, will John need ultrasound? And the answer will be yes. So, just to, uh, to what, what we, you need to remember is that the prediction that we aim at having are predictions which are predictions related to categorical values. And the the label that we need to use for training our model need, therefore, to be categorical values. Is it clear, this? Okay. So now, let's go back to our pipeline, the pipeline that we have seen before. Once we have extracted the prefixes, and we need to encode our traces in such a format which is understandable by machine learning and deep learning models. But how uh, can we encode the data? Well, the simplest way for encoding data is using a Boolean encoding. What does it mean? So we need to transform our log, so our set of traces plus the label that we want to teach to the model, into a format which is understandable by these machine learning techniques. And usually these are vectors, vectors of fixed sides. So what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can take the alphabet of all the activities that occurs in our log. And we can consider each activity as uh, an item of our vector. And then we can just uh, build a, a vector the, in which uh, for each activity that occurs in the trace, we set uh, the, the, the corresponding item to true. And for the activities that do not occur, we set it to false. So for sigma one to true or, or to one and zero, let's say, for simplifying the true and false. So for sigma one, for instance, uh, visit patient occurs. And so we set uh, the item corresponding to the activity visit patient to one. Compute rate does, let's assume that does not occur in that execution, so we set the compute rate to zero. Uh, perform ultrasound occurs in trace sigma one, so we set it to one, and get payment does not occur, so we set it to zero. 
What about uh, Sigma K, for instance? So in this case, we observe compute rate and get payment. So we will put to one compute rate and uh, get payment. And then, of course, we put the label. We use the label for, uh, for the training part. So, oh, sorry. So we use the label when we encode the trace prefixes for the supervised learning part. Of course, when we have our ongoing uh, execution, we want have the label because it's exactly what we want to predict. We want to predict the label of our ongoing execution, which is our prediction. Okay, so we have seen this Boolean encoding, which is the simplest one. Okay, what is the problem of this encoding? The problem of this encoding is that we are not caring about how many times we observe an activity. We are just saying an activity occur or occurs or it does not occur. So another more sophisticated uh, way of encoding data, of encoding traces, is to apply this frequency-based encoding. In this case, we do not only observe whether the activity occurs or not, but also we count how many times it occurs. So when we encode with this kind of encoding, what we do is we always use the alphabet, so the, the set of the activities in order to label the, uh, our, the items of our vector. And then, instead of just having one, zero or one, we count how many times we observe that activity. So for instance, uh, for sigma one, we observe uh, visit patient twice, and so we encode it as a two. Uh, compute rate, uh, never. Perform ultrasound once, and get payment, uh, never. And then we report the label for the training part and not for the runtime part. For sigma k, similarly, we have two occurrences of get payment and one occurrence of compute rate. So what is now the problem? The problem is that we have not considered at all the sequence of the activities. We are just counting how many times an activity occurs. And we are not uh, observing uh, I mean, whether visit patient occurred at the first position or at the last position or in the middle. So another type of encoding which takes into account the sequence of the data is the simple index encoding. Here, the label of our vector are not the activity names, but rather the, uh, the position, the activities at position one, position two, position H. So here we are assuming that we are uh, looking at data at prefixes of length H. And uh, we uh, encode our data by looking at the activity which occurs at position one. So for instance, for sigma one, visit patient. For um, at position H, perform ultrasound. And similarly for sigma K, so at position one, compute rate. And at position uh, H, get payment. Okay? So, uh, well, here we have this... Um, uh, we have this encoding with, with also some categorical values, which are visit patient and perform ultrasound and not numerical. And we will see later that uh, it often happens that uh, machine learning methods require num num numbers. And so we cannot use uh, categorical values, but we need to transform these categorical values into numbers. But we will see later uh, a technique for transforming uh, this, this kind of categorical values into, into numbers. Okay, so what we are forgetting with this kind of encoding? We are forgetting that we are not considering at all the event payload. So we are just looking at the activity names and we are not considering the data payload. So what we can do is to uh, have another type of encoding which is called latest payload. And here, what is the idea? The idea is that uh, this, is, this is always our log in which, uh, uh, besides the sequence of activities, we also have a trace attribute, which is the age of the patient. And uh, we have uh, a, uh, a, a, the department, which is an event attribute. So it changes each time we change uh, the, the event. So for the visit patient, the department is clinic. For performance ultrasound, the department is radiology. How can we? take care also of this kind of information, or we can take care of this information. Well, one possibility is to consider the trace attributes 
so we can have uh, uh, an item corresponding to age, and then for the event attributes to take only the latest value that uh, that event attributes take. Well, why? It's like if we consider we, have, we create a snapshot at the late latest event, and we take the latest value that is taken by that, uh, that event attribute. And so we can, in this case, we will have that uh, age for sigma one is 33, and for the department age, uh, and the, the value of the, at, of the event attribute department at position age is radiology. And uh, similarly for sigma k. But we now have completely forgotten the sequence of activities because we are focusing only on event data. So now the question is, how can we encode both together? Well, we can have this index latest payload encoding that actually combine simple index encoding and latest payload encoding. So we have both first the trace attributes, then the activities at position one, at position two, at position age, and then the value of the event attribute department at position age. So for instance, for sigma one, the age is 33, the activity at position one is visit patient, the activity at position age is perform ultrasound, the value of the event attribute department at position age is radiology. And similarly for uh, sigma k. Okay, still we are missing a last, uh, a last uh, thing, which is, okay, now we are considering both event payload, both, both activities, both the control flow, both the data payloads, but we are only considering the latest value of our uh, data payloads. We are not considering how um, the department changes along the, the different events. And so we have uh, a, la a last uh, um, encoding, which is the complex index encodings, which take into account also the data flow. So not only the, the, sequence, or the, the, the sequence of activities, but also the sequence of uh, values of event attributes. And so we don't have only the value of department at position eight, but we will have also the value of department at position one, at position two, at position three, and so on and so forth. And so we have a very complex encoding in the sense that it has to take care of, uh, for each, uh, it, it, it has to take care of the trace attributes, then of each activity at each position, and then for each event attribute, you need to look at how it evolves along the execution of the process. Okay, and so this is the same for uh, sigma k. Okay, so uh, we have seen, uh, we have extracted the prefixes, we have seen how to encode these prefixes, and now we can apply a machine learning technique. In, in the case of categorical values, usually you apply classification-based techniques, like for instance, decision tree, random forest, support vector machine, you can apply whatever kind of classification, classification uh, technique. Um, these are the ones that are most used in, uh, in the literature. And uh, moreover, you can also have uh, some works also have a bucketing phase before uh, the encoding. So after you have computed the, the prefixes, you can bucket together your traces um, and then encode them. Why do you want to, to bucket them? Well, you may want to bucket them because, for instance, you want to cluster together traces which have a similar behavior and then train a model only for that cluster of data. Or you may want to cluster together traces uh, which has the same prefix length and build several models, one for prefix length two, one for prefix length three, one for, pre for pre prefix length four, and so on. And then you encode your traces, and finally you will have several different uh, predictive, uh, predictive models, for instance, one for all the prefixes of length two, of length three, of length four. And when you are at runtime and you have your, uh, your ongoing trace, you first need to identify what is the bucket you need to take into account. For instance, this trace, assuming that we have used the prefix length for making our buckets, this trace has length three, so we need to query the predictive model related to the bucket of traces that we have built with traces of length three. So the predictive model of the bucket of prefix size three. 
we identify so the correct bucket and uh, we encode the trace and we query the only that specific predictive model and we get the prediction. Okay, the second, uh, the second type of predictions that we can, um, we can look at are the numerical uh, predictions. What is here the idea? The idea is that the prediction that we are looking for is a number, usually. And so also the label that we want to learn is a number. So uh, for instance, we want to answer to the question, when will John need uh, ultrasound? And uh, we want to learn a function such that it, uh, given a uh, log and given John's ongoing execution, it returns a label, which is a number, as I said, which tells us in how many days John is going to be recovered. As you may see now, the label is a number and not, more, uh, not anymore, the label that we want to learn is a number and not anymore true, false, or yes, no, or a categorical value. What kind of encoding we can use? Well, we can use exactly the same encodings that we have seen before. The only thing that changes is that in the training phase, the label is a numerical, a numerical label and not a categorical one. So we can use the Boolean, so we will set a one or zero according to whether the activity occurs or not in the execution. We will use the frequency, counting how many times each activity occurs in our trace. We can use the simple index, so um, we can see, we can look at, uh, uh, at the activity name at each position, the latest payload by looking at uh, the trace attributes and only at the latest value of the event attributes. Or the index latest, which combines simple index and the latest index and the complex index encoding. Okay, and also here, let's say the pipeline is exactly the same, what is going to what it can possibly change is the type of techniques that you use, which will be more a regression technique because you need to look at the machine learning techniques that predict numbers. And also in this case, you can bucket your traces so that you have different predictive models. Okay, do you have questions? I think uh, when you consider this kind of prediction, there are some, maybe not in your example here, but usually in the real world, you have uh, directly cor correlated uh, events that uh, follows one another. And maybe if you, you make the cut at this moment, when one is uh, always like correlated with the other, you would get some kind of leakage there. Yeah, it, it could be if uh, you, you need to indeed uh, explore different, uh, different prefix lengths in mm -hmm. order to be able to avoid, uh, avoid this. But do you have pro problems with that or? Uh, yeah, it could, you, it could, you, or? you could have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, so what is the optimal length that uh, from prefix? Okay, there is no a, a, a rule yeah. for that. Uh, what, you, what you can do is, uh, of course, I mean, when you are predicting next activity, you should, you should try mm -hmm. to, to explore the whole sequence the, un, until the end, mm -hmm. because so that you learn at each position what, what is the best thing to, to predict as, uh, as, as next position. Uh, when, uh, you, when you are instead uh, predicting the final outcome, well, you, you need to take into account, you, you can use what, you, I would say also in that case, it would be good to look at all the prefix length and to have at least one model for each prefix length so that you are ready to, uh, to, to, to you are prepared to predict any kind of uh, uh, prefix length. But of course, you, yeah, uh, I mean, there is not a general rule. I, I would suggest that the most, uh, the, the, the most, uh, the, the latest you have, the, 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 the longer you have the prefix length, the better it is. But as you were saying, when you, when you reach very long traces, you won't have enough data for training your model. And so that would be, that would be a problem. It, of course, depends on the data sets that, uh, that, mm. that you have. Usually, it often happens that if you need to make a prediction on the latest value, on the final outcome, you can have a look at, uh, let's say, um, you can imagine that you are at, uh, at the middle of the execution or at the beginning of the execution, so in the first half of the execution and mm -hmm. not later on, I would say. 
So, <laughs> but of course, yeah, it could be a problem as you as you were saying because for longer traces, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, my other question: How does this um, cope with uh, missing data? So, does Sorry? it? How does this system? How does this classification cope with missing data? Okay. Well. Of course, if you have uh, missing data, you can either use a symbol, which is like a padding symbol that you that, that you use really as a symbol which is agnostic about. I mean, it does not have any other mean, meaning. So you mean missing data in the for in the training part when you have. Uh, when in a, in a, for a trace, right? Uh, in a trace. Well, in both cases. So it, when learning and also when um, applying it to to a predictive a case you want to predict. Yeah. So how does that cope? And for instance, there's missing attributive data. So not events. But, uh, but data, yeah. Usually you you put anyway a, a padding, and of course already with the data the predictions are less accurate than with the activities. But for especially. When uh, you, uh, this happens because we, you have a limited amount of uh, activities, and so it's kind of uh, you have an alphabet which is a finite, finite alphabet, while for the data you usually do not have a finite set of possible values. That uh, I mean, for instance, for the department, yes, because these are categorical the data and are quite uh, easy to have a fixed number also of categorical data. But for numerical data, for instance, of course, uh, it's more difficult to make predictions. So, uh, so I would say you can use padding and you can solve the problem. Of course, the accuracy of your, of your results could decrease. <laughs> yes, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, one of the things that I was wondering about is when you talked about encoding into vectors, it kind of seems to me that the, more co the later on you went, the longer the vector became. So I was wondering if the length of the vector can cause problems in terms of scalability or in terms of training. Because if it doesn't, then I could just encode the entire database load together with its history and everything like that. But I'm assuming that is not what I want to do. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I mean, uh, you're, you're right. Of course, the, 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 the length of the vector could increase a lot and then could create problems. Uh, Usually for the examples that I have been working on, when you focus only on, uh, yeah, on this kind of complex index encoding, it is still manageable in, uh, in uh, so the B, for the BPA challenge, let's say, this is still manageable in a reasonable amount of time. We will see later on uh, just an idea of, uh, instead, if you want to include, besides uh, this uh, data related to the case you want to predict, also some information related to other cases that are uh, running together with the case you are uh, running now. Well, in that case, of course, you can have a, an explosion of the information that you want to include, and so you need to be much more careful about uh, how much information you can uh, you can include. But yeah, you are right. Of course, the complex index encoding is. <laughs> um, well, I think also also on the order of hundreds. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I had a quick question. <clears throat> uh, can, can we use the, um, the? Can you transform the problem into an NLP problem and use, for example, sequence transformers? Yeah, to, we uh, to encode it. Yeah, we will. Um, we will see now how to predict suffixes. Well, this is one of the techniques that uh, is used is used especially for predicting uh, suffixes. These sequence to sequence. Uh, uh, models. I think you were talking yes, about yes, this, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, this uh, sequence to sequence. We will see just some hints about uh, this predicting in entire suffixes, but uh, yeah, uh, this is one solution that is, uh, there are some, some uh, recent works which are using uh, this for predicting, uh, yeah, the, the exact sequence to sequence with the recurrent neural networks, we will see. We will see something uh, on, on this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Hi, uh, I have a question about the index encoding that you mentioned. That uh, basically, will you map each activity name? Yeah, like like this one. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so visit patient will become zero, perform ultrasound will become one. I'm not sure how you encode in this way so that the machine learning model can understand. 
Do you mean this one or the... No, yeah, this one, this one is clear for me because you have all the activities names and okay. one or zero if it happens or not. But this one is like a sequence and I, I'm curious how you could encode that. Yeah, you, uh, okay, you, we will, uh, we will, you, you mean how to transform this into a numerical uh, format? Yeah. Okay, yeah. we will see in just ah. one minute. Okay, okay so, uh, sorry for... <laughs> uh, and then we, you, can, uh, you can tell me if you understood the, 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 the solution. Okay, let, if there are no... Other questions? Okay, let's move to just a quick view on the uh, prediction of next events. So here the idea is that we want to predict not just one label, but we want to predict a sequence, a suffix, or of about what will happen from now on to John's history, for instance. And uh, so, uh, how do we usually do this? Well, we usually do it uh, with uh, by using some uh, techniques uh, that we will see these deep learning techniques that was uh, suggesting uh, before one of you. And uh, the idea is that actually you try to predict uh, one step ahead, and then you recursively use that information for uh, moving uh, for moving ahead so for instance you will use uh, so what that function means is that you you run uh, first you predict the next event and then you use the information that you have predicted in order to predict the next next event and uh, so on and so forth recursively and uh, so we will get predictions which are suffixes, so uh, the sequence of uh, remaining activities and the sequence of uh, uh, event data. And um, so how to transform categorical values into numerical values? One of the typical approaches that is used is this one hot encoding, which, um, which allows you to well, actually, you have an, a, an index function which maps your alphabet or all the categorical values into an index, but uh, you do not want to then use that index because you do not want to impose any order on your categorical value. So what you do then, you transform that index into a vector in which only the corresponding index uh, is set to one and all the other cases are set to zero. So just to make an example, in this case, visit patient for sigma one will be transformed into uh, the one hot version encoding of that, uh, of that activity since the index is one, will be transformed into a vector in which the first uh, uh, value is set to one and all the other are set to zero. For perform ultrasound, which is whose index in this case, so here we have our alphabet and the index of the formal ultrasound is two, and this will be transformed into a vector in which the second item is one and uh, all the others are zero. And uh, similarly for check x-ray, which is five, you will have uh, four zeros, one, one, the fifth index will be one and then the other will be zero. And so you use this kind of encoding in order to to, to transform categorical values into numerical uh, values without, uh, uh, without using any order, let's say without imposing any order. And of course, in this case, you are making your vector longer and longer and longer. <laughs> Okay, and this is for sigma k, the same, uh, the same one not encoding. And sometimes for this kind of prediction of suffixes, we want also to include, uh, well, we want to predict uh, both the suffix uh, in terms of the sequence of the next activities, but also uh, maybe the timestamp in which uh, uh, these activities have happened. And so sometimes we, always not, we use not only the one not encoding, but we enrich it with some temporal features, which are, for instance, uh, the time between the previous event and this current event. So this was the first event, so delta one represents, is, is set to zero because we do not have any previous event. The hour of the day and uh, the week of the uh, the week of the of the day. Why are we including this information, especially the hour of the day and the week of the day? Because of course, if they are business hours or uh, uh, business days or not, in uh, processes, especially business processes, can make uh, the difference. And this is. Uh, uh, more or less the idea of this uh, one-not encoding enriched with some temporal features for predicting uh, uh, suffixes and also uh, suffixes of event data. Okay, and uh, usually here you use uh, deep learning techniques, 
which are also used in natural language processing, and uh, which are usually these LSTM neural networks, which has recurrent neural networks, which have both a short-term and a long-term memory. But I won't go here into, into details. Before moving to the next uh, uh, part, I would like to say one thing about evaluation. How we can evaluate this kind of predictive process moni monitoring techniques? Well, usually an important dimension, as you may have seen uh, in this kind of uh, data, is uh, time. So usually what happens uh, is that uh, we need to take care about uh, uh, the time also when we make the evaluation. And it usually happens that we split our data set in training and testing by first chronologically ordering our data set, the traces in our uh, data set. This is how it is usually done. Why? Well, because uh, the idea is that in this way, we are as close as possible to a real world situation in which you have post-mortem data at up to a certain point, and this is the post-mortem data that you use for training your model. And from there on, you are going to use uh, the ongoing new executions in order to make predictions. And, um, and, and then, of course, the training set and the validation set, so the, the data that you use for, for instance, for tuning the hyperparameters of your machine learning techniques can be uh, executed in the first part. And this is particularly important in the cases in which uh, you have uh, so-called concept drifts in your data. So if there are changes in your process or changes in the distribution of your data, of course, you train a model with the old data, and you need to see, you can need to see how that model trained on data, on old data, perform on the uh, actually new data. And uh, the only thing I want to say, there is also, uh, I mean, some, uh, s uh, some, some works which really take a point in the timeline, a precise point in the timeline, and they um, is clearly separate the training from the test set from that point on. But also there, especially you um, are considering also, uh, let's say you are counting the distribution of your data. You need to be very careful if you do like that because either you you uh, cut away all the incomplete traces at that point and you don't use it, the, them in the training set, but this can change, of course, the distribution of the latest part of what you learn in the latest part of your training set. And also the distribution, and if you, if you trash everything which, uh, uh, which is uh, ongoing when it starts your test set, can also there you can have a change in the distribution of the data. So if, you, if in your encoding you are using, uh, you are using uh, some, uh, let's say, features that take into account also the distribution of the data, you need to be careful about uh, this strict order. Uh, cut in your, uh, in your data set between uh, training and testing. And uh, what kind of metrics are we going to use? Well, usually for classification problems, we use, uh, we use uh, so for, uh, for outcome-based predictions, we use uh, precision recall uh, FMS, the classical measures that we use with classification problems, uh, accuracy and AUC, and the higher is better. In this case, while for regression problems or so numerical problems, we usually use uh, error metrics like uh, the mean absolute error, the root mean squared error, and so on. And in this case, the lower is better. Of course, we want to minimize the error. And for the prediction of suffixes, especially of categorical values, we use this Damerol-Lavenstein distance, which is a distance between uh, the, the suffix that we have predicted and uh, the actual suffix. And in this case, the lower is better because we want to minimize the distance from what happened in the reality. OK, and uh, here I've put some references about all the works that uh, I have uh, talked about in this, uh, in this first part. Are there questions? OK. Sorry, I have a question about the page 47. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, 
I don't understand how to calculate the delta for, for example. Ah, yeah, no, the delta, it's because I have not reported, it's just an assumption. Assuming this is the first event, this is the time between the previous event and this event. Ah, so okay. since this is the first one, it's always zero. And here I'm assuming, sorry, I don't report it in the data. I'm assuming that there is one uh, hour difference between the previous event and the current event, and here that there is uh, two hours of difference between, I didn't say it, I didn't say it, two hours of difference between the previous event and this event. So let's say this uh, is at uh, 18, the previous one could be at 16. Ah, okay. It's <laughs> just simply that I forgot to <laughs> okay, tell you, sorry you for much. this. Okay, you're welcome. I, I, okay. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I have a question on the same slide, fortunately. Um, actually, uh, we, we have a concept of parallelism and uh, choice and loop in process mining. So uh, if there are uh, two events that have to be performed at the same time, then what about this vector? Uh, how this vector will work if uh, the timestamp is same, like uh, two, two, uh, uh, two activities have to perform at the same time, then how I it, will, it will respond? Well, of course, uh, you cannot, uh, either you have a start and then end the timestamp, and then you can decide to order the, the activities based on the start or in the end uh, according to whether you decide. But if you have exactly the same time, you need to use them ra randomly, I would say. And uh, yeah, we, the, we, there is no any particular strategy. It's very unlikely that, uh, especially, yeah, that it happens in the, at the same time, but it, uh, it could happen. And uh, yeah, you would just, consider it as a, as a sequence. You can decide the criteria for deciding uh, what is the, I don't know, the alphabetical order, so that you always keep the same, uh, the same sequence. But uh, I mean, I would, I would not have an answer to, to this issue. And I don't think that it happens so often that you have exactly the same time. So I would say that on the big numbers, this should not be a big issue. Uh, and, and what about the loop? If, if one activity is repeating itself, then the uh, number of vector will be increased or the counter of the vector will increase? The, 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 your vector will become longer and longer and longer. Yeah. With, the same, uh, with the same pattern of activity like uh, AH, if, if we have the pattern of 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, so AH will be repeated. Uh, yeah. If there is you, a you, you, will, uh, yeah, you will repeat it and uh, you will learn that uh, whenever you observe that activity, you somehow have uh, that that part. You will learn that pattern, actually. Okay. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. I think yes. I, I was wondering if it's common to use association rules mining as well in sequential pattern mining, mm -hmm. or if uh, this classification or like predictive models overcome these methods, and in, in practice it's better to, to go directly with, with predictive models. Um, well, I would somehow say that uh, classification methods uh, are more precise with this kind of data than association rules. But this is, I, I never tried uh, empirically, but this is what, uh, <laughs> this is my, my intuition about that. So I would go, if I had to choose, I would go for classification methods also, because you can somehow, yeah, you, you can somehow take into account also um, yeah, with these encodings, uh, you, they can help you to take into account also some uh, values that possibly with association rules uh, you are not able to correctly or completely gra grasp, I would okay. say. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I will quickly go through. Uh, this uh, new, some, ju just the intuition of these new trends uh, in operational support. I want to say a few words about intercase predictions. Um, I want just because uh, all the all the all the encodings that we have seen so far actually look at uh, the uh, at, uh, the execution of a single of a single case, of a single execution. So we are not caring at all about what happens around us. But uh, let's assume that uh, you are at a restaurant and you are having your process, uh, your dinner process. 
So how long it will take for you to complete your dinner process? Well, if you are alone at a restaurant, maybe it will take a certain amount of time. But if, the, if there is only one waiter and one chef, and there are a lot of people, of course, uh, the uh, time that it takes for you to complete your dinner process uh, will be longer. And uh, what if there are some very important persons at the same restaurant that need to be served as first one? So it will take even longer. So uh, the, the intuition here is that whenever we uh, make predictions, we need to take into account also possibly uh, the dependency between uh, our executions and other executions that are being executed together with, uh, with us. And there could be different levels of dependency from other executions. We can be alone, and so we do not have at all uh, any dependency. There could be some homogeneous cases, so execution as uh, our execution, so other people at the restaurant like us. But there could be also priorities and other priorities. And the more this dependency is stronger, the more information somehow we would need to put in our encoding in order to specify uh, this kind of information. And so the most important thing is that it is uh, uh, whenever there is this intercase dependency, so dependency among cases, we want to, uh, to encode this information in our enco encoded vector. Of course, it would be wonderful if we could encode uh, all the information related to all the cases that are running together with us, but as uh, we were saying before, this would, exp would make our vector a huge, very, very huge vector. So we need to kind of understanding according to the problem that we are facing, which is the level of dependency, and select the right amount or the right level of granularity of the features of concurrent traces that uh, we are looking at. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, some uh, very simple intercase dependencies that we can consider is uh, how many concurrent simultaneous traces are being executed together with uh, the current, uh, the current exe our execution. So for instance, in a, in a time interval, let's say in one day, there are uh, 10 other parallel instances that are running in the same day in which my execution, in which the execution of sigma one is running. And so we can report this, and we can also somehow report, I don't know, the average time of these, uh, of these executions which are running uh, the same day in which we are running, because especially when there is competitions, resource competition, this could have an impact on uh, the uh, final predictions that we're going to do to have. And so having an idea of how many other traces are running together with the trace that we are encoding or the average duration of these traces could, uh, could make the difference. OK, another very short uh, thing I would like to uh, show you is about, uh, um, OK, so far we have seen predictions, but uh, uh, let's assume that we are in the case in which the doctor wants to know if John is going to recover soon, and our predictive model answer yes. But at this point, the doctor can say, OK, but why this uh, is going to happen? And uh, one way you, know, you may know that there is a huge hype in this time on this uh, explainability, artificial intelligence, this XI approach, and there is a lot of research there. And uh, this kind of research can be somehow be applied also to predictive process monitoring problems. And uh, for instance, an idea could be uh, applying these uh, techniques, uh, model agnostic techniques like Lime and Sharp, which tells you what is the impact of a feature on the, on the final uh, prediction in order to inspect also uh, the data, the predictions returned by predictive process monitoring. For instance, in the case of John, here uh, you can see these bars that represent uh, a generic output of uh, Lime and Sharp, which tells us uh, that, for instance, uh, the, the feature, the pair uh, feature value, age equals to 20, so this trace attribute is the one that impacted most on the answer that has been returned by the uh, predictive model, which was yes. And so the answer will be, we are saying that, yes, John is recovering fast because he's young, because he's just 20 years old. I mean, it's really just to give you the intuition, and I have reported here just one plot, but there exist also other plots related not to a single execution, but also to the log and to the model. I'm not reporting them here. Uh, just I want to say that, of course, the type of with this kind of explainers, 
the type of encoding that you use has an impact also on the type of explanation that you, uh, that, that you, that you receive. So here with the complex index encoding, you have this kind of explanation, but uh, with other kind of encodings, you can have a different type of explanation because the answer of the explainer will be whether the uh, pair feature value is uh, uh, how, how much or what is the feature and the corresponding value are impacted the most on the final prediction. Okay, then I would like to say something about uh, these predictions when we have some knowledge which, is, which does not come from data. So, let's, let's, let me make this example. Let's assume, okay, the, the, all the approaches that we have seen so far, they learn from historical data without any further information, without any context. Now, let's assume that uh, you want to predict the future activities of a passenger at the airport. And uh, there will be that day there is a strike. So if we ask to whatever kind of predictive process model or what are the next activities of our passenger, okay, our passenger takes the shuttle, enter via door three at the airport, makes the check-in, and then okay, now what are the next activities? And whatever kind of predictive process model we return you the classical activities that a passenger does in a day in which there is no strike, right? Because it does not know about it. But if we know that, and so of course, these will be predictions which are wrong because probably the security check at gate one cannot be made because there is this strike and the, and the passenger will never, uh, will never leave. So this prediction will be for sure wrong. So the question now here is, uh, if we know that there is a strike, how can we, let's say, tell this to our predictive process monitoring algorithm so that uh, in the end we uh, get more accurate predictions. And uh, well, there, it's possible, I mean, there exists works in the state of the art that try to guide, let's say, the, um, the, predictive, uh, the, the predictive models towards a solution which is compliant to this knowledge that we can have. So you will have uh, some uh, predictions you can uh, rank them according to their likelihood. So you could say, okay, this prediction is the first one I would return. And you can check whether it is compliant to the knowledge that, uh, that you have. Like for instance, the knowledge that there is a strike. If it is not, you discard that solution. And you say, okay, let's try with the second most likely suffix that I can predict. Okay, this is not compliant, I will discard it. And you will keep only the one that is compliant to your, to your knowledge. And this is the one that you are going to return to the to the, to the final user. Just really, I wanted to give you uh, the intuition, and you can do this by, uh, let's say, exploring the next steps, and whenever you reach, so for instance, you are at time M, you explore all the, possi all the possibility, well, let's say, in a limited number of possibility, let's say two branches at step M plus one, and then uh, you, go, you move to uh, step M plus two, and you go ahead like this until you reach an end state, which is marked here with a double circle. And at this point, you check whether this is compliant with the solution. And if it is, if it is not, you kill this branch and you continue exploring your, your next activities until you reach a solution which is compliant with, our, with your knowledge. Okay, last, just really again, the intuition. Predictions can be used also, as we said at the beginning, for making recommendations. So for suggesting what is the best action to do in order to achieve a certain goal. Uh, here the idea is very similar to the one that we have seen for predictions, but this time we are going to return at runtime a recommendation on what, on what to do. So for instance, do this or do that. And uh, yeah, we can, predict, you, we can recommend the next activity, the best resource, uh, the routing decisions. And always we usually have a goal, or a business goal, or a measure of interest that we want to optimize. Like for instance, uh, we could be interested to minimize the remi remaining flow time, to minimize the cost, to maximize the fraction of cases that is accepted, and so on and so forth. And uh, just, I want, I don't know if, want to give you really the intuition about how to use predictions in order to make recommendations. So uh, let us assume that uh, we want to uh, recommend uh, the best activity which allow us to minimize the uh, execution flow. And uh, so one thing that uh, we can do is uh, to look at the 
next activity to try all the possible activities that we can recommend and try to predict what will be the remaining time uh, so the, uh, yeah, the remaining time if we execute activity, for instance, A1. And what will be the remaining time if we execute activity A2? And what will be the remaining time if we execute activity AN? And so for all the activities. And now what we are going to recommend, we are going to recommend the activity which allows us to, uh, to achieve, to, to have a, pre a, a predicted time, a predicted remaining time, which is the lowest one. Okay, so this is more or less the idea. And you can do the same also if you have another type of business goal. For instance, if you want that John recovers soon, you can look at the states, at the different activities that you can do as next activity, and you can have uh, a look at, uh, you will discard the cases in which John is not going to, to recover, so the one, in the state one in which the recovery of John, the, the prediction of the John's recovery is no, and so you will discard that one even though it is the most likely one, and we, you will keep the one which is, uh, which brings you to a prediction which is, yes, John will recover, and with uh, the highest likelihood to, to happen. And so, in this case, we are going to recommend uh, perform ultrasound because it's the most uh, likely state uh, that, we can, uh, we, that we can reach uh, such that uh, uh, John is going to recover. Okay. Okay, and I have put also here some uh, references. And uh, uh, if there are no questions, <laughs> okay, maybe I can just quickly go through the tool support, and then I can save five minutes for questions, okay? So, tool support, uh, I want to say that uh, there are several tools which allow you to make predictive process monitoring. Uh, in PROM, you can find several plugins, uh, both uh, related to model-based approaches and machine learning approaches. In Apromore, you can also find uh, plugins which, make, uh, which allows you to make predictive process monitoring. And then the last one is Nerdizati, which is a dedicated uh, tool for predictive process monitoring. And I would like just to spend a few words about uh, Nerdizati. You can find the link uh, here. Also, well, Nirdizati, first of all, uh, uh, is a Sanskrit word, which means prophecy or premonition. And um, what is the idea of this tool? Well, the idea of this tool is that it allows you, it allows a user to, um, to uh, make, to train several different predictive models with different uh, machine learning techniques, with different encodings, with different uh, uh, type of uh, yeah, of bucketing, and uh, then it allows you to uh, evaluate and compare these different models. And so that you can select then, in the end, uh, the ones that is most suitable to, uh, to your needs. And uh, yeah, as I was, uh, as I was saying, uh, it's a kind of, we can consider it as a kind of meta tool of predictive process monitoring, because it uh, allows you uh, to compare several different uh, predictive models. So you can try several different combinations. You can see the results on a particular log, on a particular subset of your log, and then you can choose what is the best machine learning technique or the best, uh, um, I don't know, encoding for your specific problem at the hand. You can find the screencast uh, at the link. Uh, I will just, um, maybe I can go through the slides so it is faster. Uh, so you will find an interface like this one, and there are seven, seven steps. You can either upload your log, uh, you can find the log details, you can split uh, your log, you can look at the dis label distribution. So if you have a log which, and you want to test uh, whether, for instance, the, what is the distribution of true and false, you can use this labeling uh, uh, page. You can then train your models. You can check uh, okay, the status of the task and you can validate them. Let me just show you. Okay, this is the first page when you can, uh, where you can upload your, uh, your log. You can either upload it one log or you can already upload it separately, the training and let's say here we call it validation because we want to validate on several different models, but it's your test set. You can have a look at, uh, at uh, 
what are the, for instance, the number of events in your, uh, in your log, the number of events per day, and uh, the number of resources per day, and the number of new traces started per day. You can also, if you upload a unique log, you can decide to split it. And actually, here in the splitting method, you can choose the type of uh, splitting. I mean, if you want to split uh, the data set uh, ordered uh, with the temporal order, with the strict temporal order, as we said uh, before, or if we want to just split it uh, randomly. Uh, you can here, as I was saying, you can look at the distribution of the labels. For instance, in this, uh, in this case, uh, there was a label, and uh, in uh, 546 cases, uh, the label was false, and in 80 cases, it was true. Of course, when you have unbalanced data sets, the predictions could be less correct, so it could make sense to inspect also the distributions of the label. And then you have a huge... Uh, set of things you can use for configuring your training. You can uh, select whether you, your problem is a regression problem, a classification problem, or a time series problem. And uh, for each of these groups, you, can, uh, you have different uh, classification methods, and you can uh, check uh, more than one of them. And you can also to encode, uh, to, to, to check different types of encoding. And um, yeah, and then uh, the, you can look at the results in the validation page. Now I'm just, just since we are, uh, we are, we do not have so much time. I just want to tell you that, let's say, the in the validation page, you can make a comparison among all these configuration of predictive models that you have trained before, and you can identify the one that is the most suitable one for your data. So for instance, okay, here there are several different configurations. So here we have trained random forest, XGBoost, SGD classifier with different, uh, with different types of encodings. And here it seems that, okay, this blue one, SGD classifier with complex uh, encoding uh, is not performing very good in terms of F score, while there is the orange one, which is the XGBoost, which is the simple index, uh, is performing good. Um, you can also choose different uh, prefix lengths. And uh, yeah, here there is a, an average uh, visualization. And you can also inspect uh, the different things, uh, case category by category. So for instance, uh, you can look uh, at uh, the, the classification method. For instance, there, the SGD classifier. So here, we want to have, uh, uh, since on the x-axis we have the f-score, on the y-axis we have the AUC. So, um, so we want the best results are the, balls, the, the bubbles that are at the top right uh, uh, angle. And so in this case, uh, the SGD classifier is the one performing worse on different uh, prefixes and on different, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, on different prefixes, actually, while the, uh, the XGBoost and the Random Forest are the one performing better. I mean, you can uh, inspect uh, different uh, dimensions uh, through, through the tool. OK, maybe I want just to say that if you want to play with the tool, you can uh, find the version online. Plus, uh, in, the, uh, in the summer school website, there should be a, a version for the local installation of the tool, <coughs> if you want to, to do it. And there is also a link to a form if you want to fill it, a form on predictive process monitoring and on uh, this specific tool. And uh, yeah, and uh, I think uh, that's it. I will conclude. So, uh, and then we, we, so we have five minutes for questions, I guess. So we have seen what predictive process monitoring is. We have seen the main state of the art uh, of related to predictive techniques, or approaches related to predictive process monitoring and the main encodings that are used in the state of the art. And we have seen that we can um, compare and evaluate different types of uh, techniques and the configuration so as to identify the best ones. And I would say that uh, predictive process monitoring is, especially the new trends, is a field and are some fields that uh, are keeping going, uh, growing. So I think there is a space for a lot of uh, research on, on this. And I would just say that I would like to thank you all the people that I have listed here because they have contributed to the material of this, to the content of these slides. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you.
Chiara, for your nice presentation. Yeah, we have still five minutes for further questions. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Okay, I would say, no, I have never tried. I, I would say one answer is uh, uh, we do not have here the process model, the, 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 so the de facto model, so all these techniques now work only on, only, I mean, the, the ones based on machine learning techniques work only on the data, and so we do not have the, let's say, the correct model that, uh, so we cannot measure the non-conformance. Of course, if we if we add that, it could be interesting to also uh, measure possibly the non-conformances uh, and to I don't know, add a feature related to fitness to a to a model that could be I think very very useful because it could uh, easily tell you uh, I mean how how far is or is your execution from the standard executions and it could be maybe also useful uh, in the case uh, in which we have a specific content context of, um, I don't know, of uh, uh, noisy traces uh, that could be also very useful. But I think, uh, and this is one part of the answer, and the other part is uh, that instead, if you don't have the model, I think that it's correct also to, as I, I was answering to somebody else before, it's correct to also make predictions of deviant uh, cases, let's say, even if they are not correct, because that uh, in the recommendation phase could help you in but yeah, of course, if we had the model, that could be an interesting, um, an interesting thing to to look at. I agree. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question the same related to the process model and the prediction model. So <clears throat> if you use the same data to create uh, a process model and then you use this, the, uh, that data for making a predictive model, uh, could you use the process model as a kind of way to explain the predictions of the predictive model if they come from the same data source? So you mean you uh, you discover a process model and at the same time you train a machine learning model in order to make predictions? Uh, well, maybe for some ex for some predictions it could help, but I would say that it I mean this kind of explanation would help much more with the predictions done on these uh, explicit process uh, process models because there you have a mapping one to one as we have seen before if you have an explicit process you discover an explicit model and then you try to make predictions over over that uh, model i think of course the mapping would be one to one with the machine learning uh, approach uh, i don't know whether well i think that for some uh, predictions it could help but not for everything especially the ones for instance related specifically related to data maybe it would be difficult to find the connection between the mod they discovered the model and uh, why a certain prediction has been returned by a machine learning uh, model but maybe if you only consider the encoding based on the control flow so you give a prediction only based on the control flow maybe that could be could be helpful of course uh, uh, it's, as usual, uh, uh, which is, I think, somehow also related to these uh, uh, non-conformances, the noisy or the, the behaviors that are not captured by your process model could maybe be captured somehow by your machine learning model and so forth. Some of the predictions possibly you cannot have a so clear explanation, but for most of them, possibly yes, if you look only at the control flow. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much for the insightful uh, presentation. Actually, I have several questions, but uh, I can ask only one right now. Okay. Uh, everything you said about uh, predictions, either for outcome or uh, in the remaining time, numerical values, uh, the focus was only about predictions, the quality of predictions, the, uh, the, uh, the accuracy of predictions. Mm -hmm. But what about the uncertainty associated uh, with the, uh, with the uh, predictions, uh, especially if we are going to recommend a specific action to, 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 to unhappy customer, let's say. So h how to handle an uncertainty uh, that, that is attached to the predictions, either for outcome or uh, remaining time? Thank okay, uh, I okay. There are uh, when whenever you use a machine learning model, you somehow have also a measure uh, together with the prediction. You have somehow also a measure of confidence of how co well, especially yeah, of confidence or as you said, uh, yeah, the, the, or the opposite way. No, not the uncertainty, but the confidence that you have in the prediction that is returned. So yeah, that could also be an interesting uh, thing to not only return the predictions but also the confidence that uh, you have with respect to that prediction and this is as you were saying especially true in the case of recommendation because uh, as in the example that we have seen you could uh, for instance uh, assuming that you want to recommend what is the best action to take uh, maybe there are several actions that leads to to uh, for instance John's recovery soon just to make an example but you would probably uh, try to recommend the one for which the predictions of uh, John's recovery is the most likely one. So the one for which you have most confi I mean, the highest confidence, and so the less uncertainty towards that uh, that prediction. So I think yeah, it is an interesting thing that could be explored also uh, in just one returning predictions. That could be interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, also thank you from my side. I get to ask the last short question. So, uh, I was wondering if you think it would be worth it to look in the indexing, not only at left align, because right now if we're uh, indexing by appearance in the trace, we have this left alignment. Um, if it would be worth it, if we're looking at into a certain activity or a certain event that always happens towards the middle, always happens in a certain index, to uh, look at this aspect, uh, aligning it into um, that uh, position or into a heat map of that position. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, there are still methods uh, related to the encoding of the traces that have not yet been explored. And uh, I mean, I think that this could be one interesting one. And uh, yeah, I think that could be, could be, or for instance, uh, patterns uh, that occur or so not occur. And this could also, yeah, I think there are still methods that could be explored for the for the encoding. And maybe also trying to understand what is the best encoding with respect to your data could also be interesting. Interesting. So yeah, I agree. Thank you. This will conclude uh, the session. Another big applause for Claudia. Thank you.